Philips, one of the largest electronics companies of the 20th century. At their peak, their products were sold in over 180 countries around the world. It was great because people invent things together with a lot of creativity. Just uh, a paradise, really. Philips was always known for producing a lot of thought leadership, a lot of forward-looking uh, concepts, visions of the future. But by the mid-2000s, Philips' vision of the future was bleak. Philips was very close to bankruptcy. It lost more than $3 billion each year. As the world changed and consumer trends shifted, Philips fell behind in technology. And they were not actually willing to embrace a new technology. And design, racking up billion dollar losses. There was an awful lot of products which were just more mundane, regular grey boxes, if you like. This is the story of how the electronics juggernaut was forced to change the very core of its business just to survive. Come and join me into the crazy lab. The small industrial city of Eindhoven in the Netherlands is the birthplace of Philips. It's where they built an empire on pioneering products. The radio, the audio cassette, and of course, the quintessential light bulb. The company's presence is still seen all over the city. And their first factory, opened in 1892, has now been turned into a museum where Sergio Dirks is in charge of the collections. It's very important to preserve the history of uh, the company because it tells you something about where did you come from and it tells you something about your DNA. And it's an inspiration also for the future, the past, because Philips has always been a very innovative and entrepreneurial uh, company. Philips' first and perhaps most famous innovation was the light bulb. The company now produces more than 2.4 billion of them every year, but the first ones were made in this very building. And back then, they were not so commonplace. More than 125 years ago, electric light and electricity was something very special. Electric lighting in those years was only uh, used in uh, like uh, steamships and uh, factories yeah, and buildings, but not in a house. So. Producing light bulbs was very innovative, but also very high-tech for those days. It may have been an American, Thomas Edison, who first invented the light bulb in 1879, but it was two Dutch brothers, Anton and Gerard Phillips, who mass-produced it. And crucially, Phillips engineers made a significant change to Edison's original bamboo design. You can see it here. You can clearly see the filament. And that filament uh, in Philips lamps was made of cotton. He dissolved cotton in a kind of acid, and you could uh, produce large threads of it. And these threads were better in terms of quality and a quicker way to produce it. Much quicker than carving each bit of bamboo into a filament. Armed with their new high-tech light bulbs, Philips' production volume grew by over 20 times in just 10 years. The philosophy of entrepreneurship and innovation was driving the company's growth. And Jan Kimpen, Philips' chief medical officer, thinks these principles still form the cornerstone of the company. I think what characterized the company from the moment that, that Fritz Philips started the company 126 years ago was two core characteristics. First of all, entrepreneurship. And you, we see that every day in the company. We come up with, with the most wonderful ideas that nobody else is thinking about. And entrepreneurship, together with innovation, made us big in the 19th century when we were making light bulb. Everything from streetlights to Russian palaces were illuminated by Philips light bulbs. And as the company grew, it began to use their lighting expertise to produce other household goods. 
This is the first uh, radio set that uh, Philips produced in 1927. If you are able to produce light bulbs, um, it's just a small step to produce radio valves or X-ray tubes. So there are all kinds of lamps. So from producing light bulbs, Philips grew into a large uh, electrotechnical company. Not just radios, but radio broadcasts. Philips Tech touched all four corners of the globe as they boomed out daily radio shows to homes even as far as Indonesia. A radio set is like the internet of today. You can get the whole world in your living room, you know? Well, in the early 20s and the 1900s, uh, radio sets were uh, mainly used by enthusiasts, by technicians. And Philips made a, a radio set that could also be used by laymen. So it was very easy to operate it. The growth from light bulbs to radios was Philips' first taste of expansion. And it was hugely successful, the company selling over one million of these radios in just five years. Here began a strategy which prioritized a wide product portfolio that would dictate the company's path for the rest of the 20th century. Philips went global, expanding production into Asia before any of their rivals. Philips was very successful in Asia itself because they are a truly globalized company. Carissa Chua is an analyst in the consumer electronics market. They are the first consumer electronics company to really set up their manufacturing and R&D center in Asia itself. So in 1930s, they were actually manufacturing lamps in India. 1950s, they entered Singapore. And in 1980s, um, they have a TV production plant in China. And this was all before China and India really become economic powerhouse. So consumers basically grew up with the Philips brand. Philips. From electric shavers to CD players, toasters to microchips, Philips products became woven into the fabric of day-to-day -day life. Oh, the magic's gone. The minute the lights go out, you fall asleep. It's time to change your bulb to Philips. And it was their design that set them apart from their rivals. For the last 90 something years, uh, we've actually had design within the business. Now it's quite unusual that design has been around for so long. In the first instance, doing uh, packaging and uh, posters, promotional graphics. In fact, they were called the, uh, the team of artistic propaganda. Philips Design, um, within the design industry, was always known for producing a lot of forward-looking uh, concepts, visions of the future, if you will. Inside the company's labs, their scientists were enjoying the good times. It was great, because people would talk to each other and invent things together, and uh, uh, a very open uh, atmosphere uh, with a lot of creativity. Just uh, a paradise, really. Churning through patent applications at a rate of 3,000 a year, everyone owned something that was made by Philips. Just like an ordinary audio tape recorder's got, but this one records pictures as well. In 1998, I bought a Philips player that could play uh, CDs, uh, radio, as well as cassettes. And it had served me very well, even up to today, it is still working. In the 1950s to 1980s, uh, this white goods and uh, consumer appliances were very popular among the consumers because they were the first to be introduced. Um, so they were uh, technologically advanced, um, considered to be technologically advanced at that time. My family actually uh, purchased a Philips uh, CRT TV television itself. And at that point of time, if you're looking for premium TVs, it's usually Sony or Philips uh, because they were a trusted brand to consumers. And they have a local production, which allows them to drive a faster turnaround time. And they can cater their local products to the local uh, taste and preferences. But by the 90s, Philips' fortunes began to change. In 1990, they announced losses of over 2 billion US dollars, the biggest corporate loss in Dutch history.
It was exactly Philip's large product portfolio that began causing them problems. Philips was uh, over-diversified. It just had too many products and spreading itself too thin, even if it had um, a superiority in certain technologies, but it was not able to focus on it and do it really well. Philips had morphed from an innovative company with expertise in core products to a sprawling conglomerate of over 120 separate businesses, ranging from vacuum cleaners to video games. The management needed to refocus and consolidate their business. It lacked uh, marketing capabilities and it also lacked strategic focus because it was all over the place. Hello? Honey, I'm having the baby. Seeming to confuse expansion with success, Philips diversified further into the notoriously competitive mobile phone market. Today, neither time nor distance can keep us from sharing our lives. Closing the business 12 months later, it was a failed venture that cost them over 500 million US dollars. You talk up to six long hours. I love you, honey. Honey? By the 1980s, the profit margin of Philips dropped to less than 1%, and its market share also had eroded in the US, Europe and Asia. Across the world, the Philips brand was becoming dangerously overstretched. In large markets like Europe, their market share for consumer electronics fell by over 10% in 1993. Over the next decade, losses would rise to over 1 billion US dollars as the company became the victim of even bigger consumer and technological shocks. By the mid-90s, the global electronics brand Philips was a company in disarray. Producing a vast range of unconnected products, the company had lost its core focus. Apart from the TV and audio business, they also have their appliances, they also have their medical business. A 300 million US dollar loss in 1996 forced them to make a change at the top. They hired Cor Boonstra, a CEO with a strong background in marketing. The then CEO said that we want to unite the company into a One Philips initiative. But the problem of this is that each uh, business unit still has their own profit and loss accounts. And this made it very difficult for them to really drive revenue because they are all competing against one another. In an attempt to rectify this problem, Boonstra knew he had to make Philips more streamlined. His first move was to close down the company's loss-making divisions and make drastic cuts to the workforce. The losses that Philip suffered were so bad that it had to uh, lay off more than 60,000 employees over 18 months and it was encountering very serious uh, cash flow problems. So it had to also uh, cut down on those um, expenditures on units that are loss making. It consolidated uh, its plants and it also consolidated uh, its supplier base. In 1999, Philips was a shrinking company. 40 businesses were dissolved, and 50 factories closed down. And true to Boonstra's roots in the marketing industry, he attempted to reinvigorate the brand, introducing a new slogan portraying Philips as a company focused on customers' needs. Philips, let's make things better. But although Boonstra increased profit margins, he was unable to increase long-term product sales. Philips' size was still proving to be a problem as they were slow to respond to market trends. Philips is a huge organisation and so the decision making actually was very decentralised and uh, mixed among multiple heads and uh, over a prolonged period of time. It made it very difficult uh, for Philips to be able to launch products uh, you know, in a competitive way. Compared with other global electronics companies, Philips was severely overstaffed. Sony's workforce was 100,000 people fewer than Philips, yet their revenues were 15% higher. The Japanese players were able to build very high productivity uh, production facilities uh, in Japan. However, um, Philips had more than 500 plants scattered all over 50 countries, and uh, the production capacity was not uh, optimized. And this operational inefficiency was most seen in Philips' TV business. 
At their peak, one in every seven televisions sold around the world carried the Philips logo. Ricky Primalani, whose family have sold electronics in Singapore since the 1970s, remembers Philips' heyday well. Uh, the store first started selling Philips television from the early days. Philips, as a brand, has a very good reputation, especially in Singapore, especially in home appliances. So from day one, their irons, their vacuums, it's easy to sell. So when a customer walk in and if you present them with a Philips, well, your sale is sort of quick. You don't have to talk much. It's, their, their reputation is up there with the best. But by the mid-2000s, Philips TVs were starting to come under pressure from the emerging and technologically superior Korean electronics companies. Everyone's invited. The Korean took everything by storm. Everyone was left, left to play catch-up, basically. In the last 10, 15 years, that's when I would say the Korean revolution. The Samsungs, the LGs came very strong and really got a foothold and dominated the market. And that has caused Philips to sort of be left behind. The consumer electronics market is very competitive. Uh, it's rapid innovation, it's a vicious market. And within the consumer electronics market, I think it's all about being bigger, being better, and offering cheaper solutions to consumers. When others say they have the most brilliant, the sharpest, and clearest pictures, Compare them with the new LG GoldenEye Plus. The Korean revolution was in full flow, and the new players in town, Samsung and LG, employed aggressive marketing campaigns, targeting younger consumers with their newer, cheaper, and technologically sophisticated TVs. No matter how big or small the pictures may be, the LG GoldenEye Plus, an eye for perfection. The products designed by uh, Samsung and Sony uh, were very appealing in terms of design and were able to engage um, the younger generation then that were born in the 80s and 90s onwards. Philips products were made to seem mundane in comparison, and their century-old reputation for cutting-edge design was at risk of disappearing, potentially even losing them new workers and designers. I recall it very well. I was uh, living and working in San Diego in Southern California, and uh, I was enjoying a cup of coffee out in the sunshine, and uh, I got a call from a headhunter and uh, asked me if I'd be interested in talking to him about a role at Philips. And uh, it took a few minutes to kind of reconcile Philips. Yeah, the toothbrush and light bulb company. I remember Philips. Um, from the outside, you could see categories like kitchen appliances, uh, as I said, very playful design, very humanistic design. But equally, there was an awful lot of products which were just more mundane, regular gray boxes, if you like. Sean Carney is one of the world's leading designers and his first instinct was to turn down the job offer from Philips because their range was so uninspiring. I knew there was an opportunity for design to do more and how we could uh, evolve design, but I wasn't entirely convinced this was a company that uh, was really at the same level of the company I was in. When you look across the wider portfolio of Philips, there wasn't the consistency of uh, adopting design in the same way. And the pressure on Philips was about to increase dramatically. In the mid-2000s, the world was in the grip of a technological revolution. The internet changing the very fabric of human life. But as the world was going digital, Philips stuck with the analog, continuing to produce analog CRT televisions when their rivals were making digital LCD screens. Philips was actually slow to embrace LCD technology because at that point of time, the CRT TV was basically a cash cow for them. And going into the LCD TV market, it would cannibalize the sales of their own CRT TVs. Internally, they were saying that if you want good picture quality, you should just stay with CRT. But I think what they have actually really underestimated the development of LCD technology. From 2007 to 2011, Philips TV sales suffered losses of more than 1 billion US dollars. And there were similar stories across their other electronics products. In their audio business, an industry they'd shaped when inventing the audio cassette, they now seemed desperately behind the times. Philips sold off its uh, audio division because they found that its target consumers were no longer buying CDs nor DVDs. Instead, they were going online for uh, downloading of music. 
With outdated products and falling profits, the future of the company looked dim. In 2011, they reported an annual loss of 1.5 billion US dollars. It was almost lights out for Philips. One of the biggest conglomerates of the 20th century was in dire straits. At the core of Philips' empire was consumer electronics, but with soaring production costs, collapsing sales and technological shocks, Philips desperately needed a change of direction. But behind the damaging headlines, the management was actually laying the foundations for a transformation. Philips ran on acquisition spree between 2007 and 2010, and uh, it spent close to $8 billion in acquisition. Philips' billion-dollar loss in 2011 appeared to reflect a disastrous financial performance. But it was the result of vast sums of money being invested to transform the company's fortunes. So even though it had a net loss of $1 billion in 2011, it's not uh, really a bad thing because um, the acquisition, the restructuring effort and the cost of them incurred in the earlier years did help the next CEO uh, to continue to build on the strategy of focusing on three key areas, which are lighting, consumer business and healthcare. Having acquired medical companies in the USA and Asia, Philips were planning a shift away from consumer electronics towards healthcare. And in 2011, they appointed the CEO that would lead Philips into this new chapter, Franz van Houten. Franz van Houten was an economist by training. In fact, he spent 25 years working in Philips, in Philips Data Systems and Philips Semiconductor before he took over the role as a CEO. He was a visionary and was able to focus his company on uh, very strategic areas. And Van Houten wasted no time in making his first major strategic decision. In 2014, he announced that after 120 years, Philips would split into two separate companies, lighting and healthcare. So this allows actually um, you know, both units to focus on what it can do best and to be uh, pretty self-contained. By splitting the company, uh, it was able to allow the divisions to focus on their uh, respective markets and to build their leadership position. Philips had always had a small healthcare division, but Van Houten now planned to make it the company's main focus. To signal his intent, he appointed Jan Kimpen, a medical doctor, as Philips' new chief medical officer. Philips is going through a transformation. And I think when Franz van Houten joined the company in, uh, uh, in 2011 as the new CEO, he brought a lot of leadership to the company. And I think what he did very well was to read the outside world, to read the transformation that was going on in, in, in healthcare. And he decided to change the company in a pure health technology company. As the world's aging population was increasing, Philips identified healthcare as an industry that would rapidly grow in importance. And they predicted that demand would be greatest amongst Asia's new middle class. Look at China, which has a huge population. Um, where the middle class has increased dramatically from 20 to 60 percent over, over a period of, of a few years. There is, is, are people now, huge numbers of people that have the resources to, to buy healthcare, to pay for healthcare, that have, that have also their, their wishes in healthcare. They, they, they want something, they have needs. In this industry, they have big ambitions. The company's new goal is to improve the lives of three billion people each year. This new, this new way of working to connect all these business units behind that big vision, it was communicated there for the first time real strong. And that already made a big difference. So we restructured the whole company so that all these separate business units were not as separate anymore as before. And that was the first step to take the big vision, the communication to the leadership, and the restructuring of the company. And I am a part of that restructuring. 
Over the previous two decades, there had been many attempts to slim down Philips. But this time, the restructuring was matched with a change in attitude. Now, all employees were united under the company's new direction into healthcare. And this change is perhaps most seen in Philips Research Labs, where Philips have put their trust in someone who, when you first meet him, can come across as a bit of a mad scientist. So come and join me in, uh, into the crazy lab. And why is this uh, called the crazy lab? It's because I can sort of do anything here. Um, I do a lot of optics, mechanics, and it looks like a mess to you, but I can do measurements. You see microscopes and uh, delicate stuff, and, and this is really active. So uh, it, it looks like a mess because it's actually used. Despite this apparent chaos, there's a method to this madness. You try something that you think you know what it's about, and then always something pops up that you say, aha. Uh, I've got something here that nobody's seen before. And uh, it's very hard to explain, but uh, it's the life of a scientist, yeah. <laughs> Phillips had learnt from their mistakes. Whereas before, scientists like Martin were encouraged to work on a wide range of products, now the directive from management was to be focused. Philips became really big, and we had the healthcare division, but also the semiconductors, the light, uh, lighting division, the components division, and so on. And whatever you would invent would be useful in some place in the company. And uh, of course, now this has changed because you're now a health technology company, so we have to be more focused. And so I think it's a logical consequence of uh, who we are nowadays. People need to be empowered to play their role in this Philips transformation. When we decided to focus on health technology, you also need to trickle that down, that everybody working for the company can be empowered to do that within the framework, but with that single goal in mind, and not with the goal in mind, I'm empowered to sit in my lab and do whatever I like, without that being related to the big strategy and the big vision. And not just in the labs, the whole company was undergoing a radical change in line with this big vision. Sean Carney, one of the world's leading designers, did eventually decide to work with Philips because he recognized the sea change in their fundamental business strategy. When I came about six years ago, we were still based in uh, another building. and We were separate from uh, all the research community we have here, so we took the deliberate decision to move design onto this campus to be right in the middle of all this uh, technology uh, creation. And through that, we now start to see that there's no boundaries between what the technologists and researchers are doing and what design is doing. And this is where it all comes together. And this is where you start to see the magic happen as you've got creative thinking coming together with uh, the scientists and the scientific mind. Uh, and it's just been incredible what, what that unleashes. Not just about the aesthetics of the finished product, now, design thinking is even used to encourage innovation and new ideas, using objects that you might normally find in a toy box. A lot of people struggle to get their ideas down on paper, so not everybody can sketch, of course. So we developed this, which is a way of um, kind of doing 3D ideation. So you can write ideas down on here, you put it on, uh, on a table. Uh, we've got objects such as houses, uh, so you can show, well, I'm talking about the consumer in their home, talking about the hospital, and I'm using a bridge to build between the hospital and the home. So I'm already starting to create a visual picture of uh, hospital to home. What may seem like just a bit of fun is actually a valuable tool that Sean has implemented to ensure Philip's employees work well together. And I've seen some very passionate um, uh, displays of creativity from probably the guy who's the most stuffy and conservative person walking into the room suddenly has got sleeves rolled up, tie off, and they're getting engaged and they're telling the story. And that's the way you could also drive that level of engagement in developing new and creative ideas. Over the last two years, Philip's growth in the healthcare industry has been remarkable. In 2016,
the company invested almost 2 billion US dollars into research and development. And that same year, they opened a new multi-million dollar regional headquarters in Singapore. Employing 900 staff, it would serve as Philips Healthcare Hub in Asia. This is a very important region for us, and we see trends that are quite similar to the rest of the world in terms of aging populations, increasing chronic diseases, non-communicable diseases like cancer, like diabetes, like heart issues, and they place quite a strain on resources for healthcare. In Asia, the number of people over the age of 70 is predicted to increase by over 300% in the next 50 years and Philips have tailored their healthcare technology to prepare for this spike in senior citizens. If you look at elderly people, we will have another 700,000 silver generation being added uh, 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 to the current elderly population in Singapore. They are requiring healthcare. If you look at the current healthcare system, it will not be able to cope with so much elderly people in the society. So you actually also need to evolve the healthcare system to also being able to better address the need of chronic patients. What we also see in this region actually is a high penetration of internet usage. Uh, smartphones, for example, 45% um, of the world's internet users are in Asia. And that also gives us the opportunity to bring care to people, to empower people to look after their own health with digital programs. Digital programs like the remote monitoring system currently being tested in Singapore. Patients measure their vital statistics on devices at home, and the data is automatically sent back here, where Diedrich Zevin and his team of medical professionals monitor it around the clock. And this is what you see here, where we have our staff here in Apex Center actually monitor patients in their homes here in Singapore, day by day, seven days a week, and actually improving the outcome of the healthcare system improving the quality of people's life. When I see the data, I will assess the condition. If the reading is of abnormality, then I will call a patient to assess. Uh, this a preventive measure. Think in terms of a daily measurement of his blood pressure. Think in terms of a daily measurement of uh, the heart rate. Think in terms of temperature or weight. And even also a questionnaire about how a person is feeling actually during that day. And using that data, we're mapping out what actually is the health status of that patient. Is he or she feeling well? Is he or she gaining weight? And so on. Still in its pilot stage, 120 Singaporeans are enrolled in the system. And they can do their routine checkups from the comfort of their own homes rather than going into the hospital. We know, of course, if a patient is able to recover at home, that does two things. It, it frees up the hospital bed, lowers the costs, but it's much better for the patient because they recover much better if they're with their family and at home. And we've been able to prove not only the, the better outcomes, but also things like lower readmissions to hospital by more than 30 to 40% in some cases. We are in new course going to expand this across Asia. We are learning here in Singapore. We're also learning in Australia to very different countries, different healthcare systems also. And as soon as we get to a critical amount of learning together with our partners, we for certain roll this out across to other countries where this is relevant. And to be very honest, it's going to be relevant in every country. This is an example of the new Philips, not merely selling medical hardware, but providing new ways of delivering healthcare. And similar technology is also being used in far more remote areas of Asia by the people who need it most. Over the last two years, Philips has transformed itself to become a respected healthcare provider. And their modern medical technology now improves people's lives in some of the most remote parts of Asia. Jayapura, a small town on the Indonesian island of New Guinea, is the location for Philips' latest medical innovation. 
Today, local midwife Lou Remiati is preparing to do a home checkup on one of her expectant mothers. Saya akan berkunjung ke rumah pasien karena pasiennya kemarin ada keluhan sedikit. Terus ini keluhannya itu dia bilang agak pusing dan sudah agak lama dia tidak datang berkunjung. Jadi saya harus mengunjungi pasien. Kunjungan rumah sangat penting untuk menurunkan angka kesakitan ibu dan bayi. Begitu juga untuk menurunkan angka kematian. Her patient lives over two hours outside Jayapura, where the nearest health center is located. The distance means it's difficult for expectant mothers to travel to the health center for regular checkups. They rely on home visits like this. We increasingly also engage in trying to serve the underserved markets. We know from studies and also from the epidemiology there that in these remote areas, the prevalence of uh, mothers dying during pregnancy or during delivery, as well as neonatal mortality, was unacceptably high. And that is mainly because there was no access to the healthcare system from these remote areas, at least not in an urgent way. Permisi. Selamat sore. Sore, Ibu. Ya. Eh, bagaimana? Sehat? Ya. Kita mau periksa Ibu dulu. Oke. Okay. Ya. Bisa kita ke dalam, Bu? Okay. Ya. Nanti kita periksa dulu, ya. Habis kemarin Ibu katanya agak kurang enak badan. Ya. Ya, nanti kita timbang, tensi, baru periksa perut sekalian, ya. Dita Wender is six months pregnant, and at this stage, it's important to monitor the baby's weight and movements closely. Using the ultrasound, both nurse and mother can hear the baby's heartbeat. Ibu tahu bayinya sehat kalau bayinya bergerak, ya. Kalau saya tahu sehat dari denyut jantungnya, ya. Itu harus kuat terus bergeraknya. Kalau tiba-tiba geraknya lambat. Ibu cepat ke puskesmas eh kalau umpama malam ke rumah sakit. Ya, tidak boleh dia gerak lambat. Ini denyut jantungnya kuat, itu sehat ya. Kalau geraknya lambat, itu dia kurang sehat namanya. Berapa? Laki-laki atau perempuan? Tadi sudah wes dia dan bilang perempuan. Gimana Ibu perasaannya sama dapat anak perempuan? Nah, kalau saya punya anak pertama laki-laki, jadi sekarang semuanya perempuan. Kenapa alasannya Bu Senang? Here's where the new Philips technology comes in. All the data is electronically entered into the mobile device and immediately sent back to the health center. Sistem mom dari Philips ini sangat bagus ya, dan kami sangat senang diperkenalkan dengan sistem mom ini. Jadi eh, begitu pasien yang sudah kami periksa, kami langsung masukkan datanya di sistem Philips mom. Dan kalau ada yang berisiko, kami akan cepat tahu karena akan segera diberitahukan dan kami konsulkan dokter umum atau dokter kebidanan. One app is for the healthcare worker or the social worker very close to mom uh, in these remote areas. These data are sent to a center of excellence, a center with experts, which can be far away, where the doctor has his version of the app, looking at these data, giving the right suggestions for treatment or for transport of the patients. Back at the health center in Jayapura, the mother's data is received and analyzed by Dr. Fitra Riyadini. Alat Philips Moms tersebut sangat berguna untuk melakukan screening, kemudian menyimpan data sehingga kita bisa memfollow up atau melakukan evaluasi lebih lanjut kepada ibu hamil, kemudian kondisi bayi yang dikandungnya. Kalau ada kondisi kritis, mulai dari pemeriksaan fisik seperti biasanya ibu hamil ada tekanan darah yang tinggi seperti itu atau ada keluhan seperti nyeri kepala, kemudian eh, nyeri ulu hati itu adalah tanda-tanda preeklampsia. Kami akan langsung melakukan rujukan ke rumah sakit eh, yang lebih tinggi layanan kesehatannya seperti itu. Philips have plans to extend this technology to other communities across Asia. But for today, the checks have gone well and both mother and baby are healthy.
Jadi kita di sana periksa tens, e, berat badan, tensi, dan dunia jantung anak. Tadi semua dalam keadaan baik. E, ya, sang, saya sangat bangga jadi bidan, e, karena terus terang e, ada kepuasan tersendiri dalam hati saya. Yang lengkap bisa hamil, bisa melahirkan. Jadi saya berusaha bagaimana mengajar ibu itu. Hamilnya sehat, melahirkannya sehat dan selamat. Begitu juga bayi yang dilahirkan sehat dan selamat. Now Philips rank in the top three global healthcare companies. Ten years ago, Philips healthcare business accounted for 10% of their profits. Now it represents more than four times that. But the company haven't completely disregarded their expertise in lighting. In the humble, even chaotic conditions of his lab, Martin may have invented another potentially life-saving device, adapting the technology behind LED lights and applying it to medical catheters. Uh, this is a catheter. Uh, the clinician holds this, puts it into your bloodstream like that, to the heart, and it will uh, measure the pressure in the heart. But instead of using electricity, like traditional catheters, this prototype uses only light to measure pressure. Um, light is coming from here. It's going to the tip. There are no electrical wires. Then the light is coming back uh, through the same optical fiber is then processed and sent into the console. And you can actually see there um, what it is. The syringe mimics the pressure inside the patient's heart, which causes the flow of light to react. So I'll put this in here. So now this is essentially a pressure chamber. So if I change the pressure here, you can see that uh, this uh, number here uh, changes. And so we can uh, measure how bad the, the blocking is. Is it 50% uh, blocked or is it 95% blocked? Far safer and more precise than electric catheters, this Philips invention could revolutionize the diagnosis of heart disease. The roots is really in light bulbs. And what this technology could mean in the real world is that you uh, replace all the electrical wiring in a catheter by optical fibers. These catheters will become cheaper and therefore they can be used uh, uh, more easily in the treatment and uh, diagnostics of patients. Whether it's life-changing health initiatives in Jayapura or cutting-edge tech in the Dutch research labs, it is the company's mantra that seems to be the driving force behind Philips' change. Philips' ambition in healthcare is to improve the lives of 3 billion people around the world by 2025. We are all passionate about this, this big mission. That is what everybody works for every day. Everything we do is with that specific goal in mind. How do we touch through our innovations people's life, improve people's life by utilizing our technology, by partnering uh, with relevant partners in the countries that we are active all across the world and in fact deliver a real contribution to the sustainability of society. The fact that this new focus on healthcare has helped the company record 20 billion US dollars of sales in 2016 is equally remarkable. From a company that first specialized in light bulbs to one that is saving people's lives and helping to bring new lives into the world, Philips is now addressing some of the most challenging health problems facing society today. We are on the right track to address the big challenges in healthcare. If I can take one step back, what are the big challenges now? The world population is growing enormously. This aging population comes with a lot of diseases. We have one billion people with high blood pressure in the world out of the seven billion. We have half a billion with diabetes and with respiratory diseases. We have 14 million people with cancer uh, every year, new patients. It is unconceivable that we can address this enormous burden on healthcare just by doing things better than we did yesterday. We have to do other things, we have to transform medicine.